Conevals was always focused on the Nansen ski jump uh, and having ski jumping events where they would invite Olympic contenders and, and the best that the colleges had to offer uh, in the way of ski jumping. They got the experience of what it was like to have uh, winter activities in the North Country like skiing and sledding and sliding and the, and the ski jumping. And I remember one year my parents telling me that there wasn't going to be enough snow for the ski jumping um, festivities. But a few days before the jumping uh, came about, it started to snow. And it snowed. And they finally had enough snow that they were able to pull everything off. They were thinking of trucking in snow from somewhere. And they, of course, it had been kind of a dry, dry season. But it snowed a while and uh, the ski jumping went off as planned and everybody was happy. And it also generated a lot of income for the city. As people would come into town, gas up their cars, they would uh, eat here. Of course, some would stay in the area, so it was definitely a money maker for the area. It was called Hockey Town, USA. Tied directly to its French-Canadian roots, Berlin, New Hampshire was known throughout the region and Canada as the epicenter for ice hockey in the northeastern United States. We'd get together and go to ice rink. They had ice rinks in a different part of the uh, city. And we'd get together and play some bang-up hockey, you know. We had to go in the woods to get a, get a limb that was the shape of a hockey stick. Use that as a stick. And then we used to keep out the cat logs and use that for shin pads. I was in grammar school when I was 12, 13 years old. My, my father was a big hockey player all his life, and he wanted me to play hockey. I didn't know how to skate, so my, my, my dad wanted me to learn how to skate. So he built in our backyard a skating rink. And we've had the, and we had that skating rink for 12 years. I can remember and my dad flooding below zero nights. He's out there, and I was helping him. And and then the snowstorm scooping out. You know, we didn't have a snowblower. <laughs> Couldn't afford a snowblower, so we were out there with scoops and shovels and cleaning off the rink. And I learned how to play hockey, and I turned out to be a decent hockey player. Not the best, but decent, you know. In the 1910s, Brown Company backed mill hockey teams that played against each other throughout the winter months. And through the 1920s, the Berlin Athletic Association hockey teams were a powerhouse in the region. Berlin added to its reputation as Hockey Town USA in 1937, when the Berlin Maroons Senior A amateur team was formed and soon established themselves as a major force to be reckoned with. When they had the big team, Bell Maroon, and them, and they had Lewiston and them, there used to be big crowds there. It's a, you wouldn't believe the line was there at five o'clock at night to go in the arena. Some night they had to stop because there was too many people to go in for the safety of the arena. They had to stop people coming in. One of the greatest rivalries in New Hampshire hockey history was begun when Notre Dame High School opened its doors in 1941. They would soon become the home of the greatest high school hockey team in New Hampshire history. And the games between them and their bitter rivals, the Berlin High Mountaineers, were legendary. The Notre Dame Rams iced their first hockey team in 1944 and would go on to win an unprecedented 19 New Hampshire High School State Championships between 1947 and 1972, including the very first state championship held in 1947. Hockey history was rich here with both Berlin High and Notre Dame being dominating the state of New Hampshire in, in, in hockey. And, uh, and when you picked up a schedule for the season, that's where you looked as Winburl High playing Notre Dame. And those were the biggest games here under our own roof. And more times than not, we met down in Durham or in Concord or other places for the state championship. 
We grew up going to the hockey games at the arena or watching Saturday night hockey. And of course, you know everyone and relatives are around and everyone goes to the games and it is very exciting. When Berlin ends up in a tournament game, it seems like the whole town follows them. It's so exciting. When they used to have the two local school play hockey, they used to be the big rival. A rivalry would come to a head when the two teams faced off for the last time in an overtime thriller in the 1972 New Hampshire State semifinal game in Concord with the Rams winning 3-2. Notre Dame went on to defeat Manchester Memorial High School in the finals 3-2. The Manchester Union leader later described the final game between the Rams and Manchester as the high school game of the millennium. We beat Berlin High School twice in that regular season at home undefeated to a packed, packed house. It was crazy. And then went on to the semifinals down to Durham and beat Berlin High School again in overtime and went on to win our last state championship. And it was just, uh, it was just one of the fondest memories we'll ever have as hockey players and students there. I, I can't describe it. I mean, it kind of, it kind of chokes me up a little bit because I remember it like I was there yesterday on the ice. We're very proud of our hockey heritage and history, and we close the book on it in the right fashion. Hockey was not only an activity for those who played, but it was a social event for the entire city. Ice hockey was played everywhere in Berlin, from the backyard rinks to the streets, but the gathering place for all was the Notre Dame Arena. The euphoria of the arena, just because everybody knew everybody, uh, it was great, you know, uh, just, you know, go out there and play your game. After the game, to get in that locker room, couldn't get in. People were all in there, hey, excuse me, can I change, you know? I get it, everybody leave, and, you know, oh, don't worry about it. And five hours later, Butchie Poor is still there with his skates on, and the only thing he's got off is his jersey, you know, and just with locker room talk, you know, and just uh, be uh, a lot of fun, you know. And, and the fans were great, you know, uh, to come, you know, to watch us play, you know. Even though they did, people didn't play, they still supported it, came to the game, line up and wait an hour or two outside in the cold to get into the game and would drive to Concord or Manchester Lewiston to catch the away games. I mean, we'd bring as many people to the away games as, the, as Manchester or Concord had in the stands. Truly remarkable. You don't see that. Uh, and when my son, I had my kids, you didn't see other towns follow like Berlin follows, and they still do, and it's, it's remarkable. That's uh, culture. It was always like a place to meet, you know. We didn't always have to stay at the arena, but it was a place where somebody was playing, somebody said, well, I'll meet at the arena. And from that point on, whatever we decided to do, you know, we, we left and from, but that was our meeting point, more or less, and stuff, before we decided to go to somewhere else or someone's house or someone's camp or whatever it was, but that was the place. In 1969, Berlin would face one of its worst tragedies when the roof of the arena, weighted down by snow from recent storms, collapsed. That night there, there was a uh, high school game, but it was JV team that was playing. And uh, that was the year of the big snowstorm, when we had the store 69 and 70. I was a referee, and I had forgotten my skates at home, so I called the, uh, ref the other referee that was going to do the game with me, and that was Carl Langley. And uh, I told him I said, I'll be a few minutes late, you know. And I got over there and rushed upstairs. There was a set of stairs. We used to go upstairs, and there was a balcony. And there was a door that you could go out to a balcony. People would stand there to watch games. And I opened the door, and I ordered the car. I'll be right down. And I started to tie my skates, and that's when it happened. I went to the game, um, went early, caught the warm-ups. Suddenly, the lights went out, and there was like a crack, a crackle and then the roof came down right in front of me. I just stood there frozen like, oh my, the roof's coming down. And my friend said, Jackie, you better get down. I had one skate on and I was try trying to put the other one on and I heard this big whoosh and I could see lights coming down, all the lights coming down. I looked out the window, the lights were coming down. And then the roof come down and there was a whoosh and the door flew open off the hinges right where I was sitting looking out the balcony. And I was looking, there was another window there that went outside. I was looking at that window and that's where I was going to go. 
And I mean, this is the worst experience of my life, I gotta tell you that. I just looked at the wreckage in front of me and we worked our way down the bleachers where there was an emergency exit. And we just went out the exit, waited in the parking lot to hear news. Then I got a hold of myself and one skate on and one stalk and I run downstairs to a phone booth. I called the police station right off. I told them, I said, uh, the arena just collapsed and the kids were on the ice. Send everything you can over there within, I don't know, minutes. The police department, the fire department, everybody was there. We knew the kids on the ice, so they finally decided that by getting the kids together and who was there, who got out, who got off the ice in time, you know, uh, who they were looking for and everything. So then we had to keep everybody quiet to see if anybody was stuck in there or something. And after a while, we heard one kid underneath all that top, all that stuff, and we got him out. The kid there, he, he was lucky. He was in between two big girders. We got him out, and the other one was a young bushy kid. He was my next door neighbor. And he was the goalie, never made it. There's a girder that fell right on him. When we found him, I cut his pads off. I remember cutting his pads off to see if we could get him out, you know. And Dr. Denet, he was the uh, physician at the time for hockey, you know. And uh, he went like this, he said, don't hurry. Now, that's something I never forgot. I'll never, never forget that. And I knew the family, you know, they were neighbors, like I say, you know, the kid never made it. That was a real tragedy in town, real tragedy. It really was a challenge, but as they say, uh, um, the powers that be in town got together and formulated a committee and rebuilt this arena that now stands and having been refurbished. So uh, we have a lot of hockey history with the buildings itself. It was, was really something to remember and, and go through. By the end of World War I, Berlin was quickly becoming a central hub for business and leisure in the North Country. From the 1920s until the 1980s, Berlin's Main Street lived up to its name. Restaurants, movie theaters, and businesses of all kinds populated Main Street, making it the economic and social hub of the city. You would go downtown on a Friday evening and the sidewalks were packed. You couldn't walk. I mean, or you had to stand aside for somebody to get by or for you to meet them. The stores were all lit up. I had to do their shopping, go to the movies, go to the restaurants. I, I, I liked going downtown with my friends. The main street would be jammed with cars. Once we got our license, uh, I was nothing to drive around that circle probably 20 or 30 times in the evening to see who the girls were walking here and there and stop and talk to people. It was just more of a social thing, you know, just kind of driving around, getting outside, and seeing people. If you didn't go downtown Friday night, you weren't, you weren't with it. When I was a teenager, we would shop on Main Street, and you, you could not walk two or three abreast because Main Street was just so busy. We had a very strong presence of a number of major labels on Main Street. When I say major labels, we had J.J. Newberry's, we had F.W. Woolworth's, we had W.T. Grant's. We had, and still have, J.C. Penney's. You had businesses like mine, and you had businesses like Gill's Flower Shop, and you had businesses like Valancourt Insurance that had been around multiple generations and people identified with them as Main Street mainstays and were very comfortable coming in and doing business with those people and those entities. I remember my mother saying to me when I was little, say, now if you and your sister are good girls, we'll stop by Emma's and have a nice ice cream soda or ice cream with hot fudge. And I mean, you look forward, it was a treat. Everything was a treat that we, we had. It was a wonderful city. My brother Navy, the oldest brother, was working with my father, built the most beautiful men's shop you'd ever want to see. 
We had all the men's lines. We used to sell German shoes, hot shop their mock suits, botany suits, Van Heusen shirts, Johnson wear. Had the nicest line of clothing that people would love. And of course, you let them charge. Goodridge's. It was a restaurant and a soda fountain. Delicious sodas, you know. I, I can almost taste one now. <laughs> Downstairs is where he made all his candy and he had a beautiful candy display on the side wall and it was loaded with these beautiful chocolates of all, oh, it's so good and fattening. We would just go to different shops, Hallmark, and you know, you'd go to a shop and you'd say, oh, you just go to shops all day, but you would go and then you would see someone you know, so then you would have those conversations and you would talk to, you know, the, the people who own the shops and, and they would know what was going on with you in high school and they'd ask you questions about, you know, how you're doing. My great-grandfather got involved in retail. Uh, the retail that he got involved in was a shoe store, and his second oldest son, my grandfather, took that business over and essentially ran it for him. So it would have been the third generation, my grandfather, that really developed the roots of what we now know as Moran Shoe Store. And he uh, invited my father in to work with him, and he invited me in to assist him as it turned out, I stayed in the business, uh, and I still run that business today. One of the French Canadians, uh, his name was Nat Tarion, and he used to sell hot dogs. He had a little steamer that he'd walk up and down Main Street and haul in French, hot dogs, hot dogs, hot dogs, <laughs> and they were good. We had three movie theaters, Princess Albert and Strand Theater. Strand was a new, new theater, it used to be a moose club. They made a bowling alley out of it after they had the theater. But when it's a bowling alley today, but it was a movie theater, Strand Theater. When I was a kid growing up, Saturday was a, a big treat. We'd get money to, to go down the, the matinee, it's Princess Theater movie, movie theater. The matinee, Saturday matinee show. I mean, we were there every Saturday. It was it didn't matter who, who what was playing, you know. It, you know, Godzilla, King Kong versus God, all those good, you know, creature feature movies and stuff. Whatever it was, and it was great. Elvis Presley movies. Get a popcorn and a soda and the movie. Most of the Jewish people in Berlin owned stores. They were in a clothes and uh, selling men's clothes. They had women's clothes, and then uh, we had a doctor in Berlin that was Jewish, and we had a butcher's store. There were two butcher's stores, the Rosenfield. After school, it was uh, with friends, uh, going to Woolworths. There was a lunch counter there with you know snacks, treats, uh, soda pops, and uh, root beer floats and that. Woolworths had the uh the old World War II had the, uh, the nice, uh, like, diner, and they had the, uh, oh, my favorite soda there was the, the orange, the fountain soda, orange. Oh, great. I remember that as a kid. Uh, Middle Earth was a shop that we used to go to a lot. Um, we used to go to restaurants. There was also a restaurant that was quite popular on the east side. It was called Cinnaballi's Restaurant. And uh, Mr. Cinebaldi was a nice guy, and he just let you go in his store and just talk and just have a Coke. And the place would be packed with high school kids going right on, onto the sidewalk outside the store. And the Cinebaldi, when they started his first started his restaurant, in fact, he started to make a pizza. My mother's the one that gave him his, the recipe for his pizza. When I think back at some of the vibrant activities that happened in the downtown area, I can remember my brother and myself dress, dressing up as presidents on President's Day and walking up and down the street uh, as a, you know, w with the sandwich board signs attracting business to the fact that we were having a President's Day sale. Uh, we were always out there on the street. We had something called sidewalk sales. 
uh, and we would be out there on the street. My dad would have us come down and stand on the concrete and enjoy the bright sunshine and get a wonderful suntan as we were out there representing the shoe store during the sidewalk sale days. And that was always great because it was as much a social event back then as it was a sales event, but it always drew a lot of people downtown. So, you know, it was, it was really, really hopping, and, and yet it was a friendly, um, close-knit atmosphere about it as well. It, it was really something to see. There was, uh, yeah, people were close. We had everything going. The mill was going full steam ahead. Everybody was working. It was unbelievable. The town really was an exciting, exciting town. From the end of World War II to the 1960s, the city of Berlin was at its peak. The paper mill, Converse Rubber, and other successful businesses created the economic heart of the city. 